Before I introduce our panel, I want to tell you a brief story, but we're going to get the details of this story in just a second. Because there's probably no better example of how to revitalize your rec league than what we've seen recently in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where youth soccer participation has doubled in recent years. And even during the pandemic, where pretty much everywhere else across the country we saw numbers drop, they saw their numbers grow. So how did it happen? We're about to find out. We're also going to get some great insight in this space from people who work at it from the highest level. So here's our panel. Uh, to my left, we've got Jason Targoff. He is the president of the aforementioned Cambridge Youth Soccer Association. Also, we have Jean Lee Battress. She's the executive director of MLB and MLBPA Youth Development Foundation. And next to her, Candace Haynes, the senior manager of youth basketball development for NBA. Thanks for being here. Thank you. So Jason, I, I want to dive in and kind of get all the details of what you're doing. But I want to start with you guys, actually, because I think when we think of the term rec league, we think of something that couldn't be further from MLB and NBA. So help me understand the connection, kind of how those two levels come together. Well, I think, you know, from a youth standpoint, obviously, we feel as though, you know, youth who play the game are more likely to become youth or adults who follow the game. Um, so there is a direct correlation between our work um, and, you know, the youth space, especially at the recreational level. Well, we, we have a great story. Um, a handful of years ago, actually, in our industry with baseball, both Major League Baseball, the Commissioner's Office, and the Players Association came together. Um, obviously, we came out of a tough year, but we're back in play. And we felt so compelled to bring play back locally, down the street, because transportation is a problem, low cost access, and just accessing both baseball and softball. So we formed this foundation in the past few years. We put in over $15 million, helped over 100 different projects and organizations, and we're going to keep going. And that's just the foundation alone, not mentioning Major League Baseball's development programs. So it's interesting to hear their perspective, very different from how you got involved. Tell us a little bit about the beginnings of your story. So I, I got involved like, like many youth coaches. As, I'm good. As a uh, volunteer coach of my, of my children. I coached my daughter and my son. And um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is a city of about 100,000 people, right outside of Boston. Um, and I saw this separation of, of travel and rec. And the way the organization was, uh, was marketing it, travel was for the serious kids, and rec was for kids who wanted to have fun. And um, like many of us here, I, I, I saw those two things as they didn't have to be different. And in fact, um, I thought fun and, and competition um, actually enhance each other. So I did a few things, including recruiting some of my, my son and some of his good athlete friends to stay in the rec league when he was in third grade soccer. And it's just taken off since then because people realize that you can be really competitive in a rec league that enhances the rec league and it brings more kids in. Um, and a lot of the marketing is done by the kids themselves. They want to play. So I'm interested, I'm interested in, the, in the fact that you're bucking the trend. How do you account for that? For in a time when really it seems like people are leaving these programs, you're getting more and more kids. Yeah, I think we really respect our parents in the, in the community. Um, they're not bad people if they want to send their kids to club programs or travel programs. But they feel vulnerable. Parents feel vulnerable. They're worried about their kids. They want to make sure their kids have a good opportunity to play sports. So I truly believed, and I did some salesmanship of this, probably before I had good data on it, that your kid is going to be OK if he or she plays rec soccer. And we don't call it rec. We call it city league, so you know, to try to make it sound a little more exciting. Um, but we said, look, your kid is going to be good. You're going to get great competition. Your kid is going to be able to develop as a player. And we're not going to hold her back if she plays in our city league. And I think parents often sometimes need a little hand-holding because they're all worried about their kids. Um, and by bringing it local, we just bring more and more kids in. And we all know, anyone who plays pickup basketball knows there's nothing more competitive than playing mm. amongst friends. Um, and that's true for pickup soccer, too. But I know it from pickup basketball. Um, there's nothing more competitive than playing against friends. So when you see kids playing against friends that they see in school, there's a little trash talking going on during the week. They know who they're playing against. It enhances the competitiveness. It doesn't take away. So we've just been building, building, building based on that. 
in the rec space from an NBA perspective, right? Where is your focus? I mean, is it is it parents? Something he's dealing with a lot. Is it players? Is it coaches? Is it is it all of the above? It's all of the above. Um, we, you know focus on developing resources that benefit coaches, parents, players, even officials. Um, and, and to your point, Jason, really getting back to that communal aspect of it. Um, you know, not, not to be you know, overly nostalgic, but you know, I remember you know, when I was growing up playing sports, my parents didn't yell at the refs because they were our neighbors. <laughs> you know, my coaches were, you know, it could be my third grade teacher's husband. You know, so there was that communal aspect that you know, as great as travel sports is, you don't really have that, that element. Um, and so a lot of what we do is partnering with community and school-based programs to bring back that element of community and really elevate the experience for young people as well as their parents and coaches. Is that really what it's about as well for, the, for kind of the major league, the, the NBA perspective is, is not so much to be in the communities directly, but maybe in a support role? I think we do it all. Actually, we're right inside the communities. We're with the schools, the churches, the municipalities, the politicians, the parents. I mean, parents are so critical, right? The moms, if you look at who's purchasing, mm -hmm. right, the sport per se, merchandise, games, putting them in after school programs, I mean, that's where it's at. But our main focus is underserved communities. They are the ones that are lacking access, they can't tap into travel ball. So we give them low cost. We believe they should have some skin in the game. Don't give everything for free. But I think what's nice about your motto in Cambridge is that you know you have parents who are just so influenced by the success of these programs that they're donating additional dollars to scholarship kids. And so at the end of the day, it's just a really great feel-good approach to bringing the community together. And I would say you know also involving um, law enforcement. I mean, if you take a look at PALS and Boys and Girls Clubs, YMCAs, we tap into all these organizations, so it's, it's the power of the entire community. When you have them here on the stage, does your mind start turning in, okay, ways that maybe not, it's a different sport, but how U.S. Soccer Federation, MLS, whatever those entities might be in American soccer could help your program? Or is your program really something that kind of exists in a, in a bubble and doesn't need that, that external support? Well, we get, we get external support from Mass Youth Soccer, which is a fantastic organization. And one of the, I'm not really answering your question, I guess, but. Go wherever you want. The, the, the coach training that comes out of U.S. soccer and Mass U soccer and the guidelines from U.S. soccer and Mass U soccer, they do something called play, practice, play, where they really encourage play during practice. So we're hearing this from the big organizations um, that people really respect. That, yeah, playing is how you get better at a sport. We all know that, right? You don't get better at a sport by a coach yelling at you or even talking to you nicely. You get better at a sport by playing. That's coming really, really from the top at U.S. soccer and Mass U soccer, and it's really been helpful for us um, to hear from those, those organizations. The messaging has been so important. From Is that them. kind of what you're talking about with like the ref? I just see it with a, like a referee program, right? Something that the NBA can uh, immediately lend legitimacy to. You put, you put NBA certified refs in a community, and you've solved a huge problem for that community and, and the access to the game. Right, even at the younger levels. So we've partnered with our referee operations group um, to bring current and former officials into communities and train young people to be certified refs as well, um, which obviously helps you know, municipal budgets, helps put some money in those kids' pockets, exposes them to opportunities you know, as looking at officiating as a potential career path, as well as exposing them to other careers in sports and developing transferable skills around conflict resolution, time management. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's a real opportunity for us to lend that legitimacy, um, you know, not just to officiating, but to that rec-based program as a whole. Jimmy, I wonder what you think, what you feel when you see like Naima, who is up here on the first and, and somebody who is, not just a kid who's gone through Nats Academy, but really seems to have spent a significant portion of her sports time in that academy and, and really benefited from it. Well, um, I'm not exactly agnostic because the Youth Development Foundation actually helped contribute to the Nats Academy and get the YBA program up and going. So that's a success story. Um, you know, the academy is more than just baseball, softball. It's, it's a community center. The kids are in there, they learn about gardening, their social emotional learning. Um, we want these fields and academies to be hubs, right? Bringing in the families to learn more about the game, but also you know, parenting and mentoring. So 
Um, it's, it's exciting. And if I could replicate this in every city and town, we would. And looking into next year, we're planning to work with 120 markets um, with minor league baseball because now they're under the commissioner's office. So this is pretty exciting. We see a huge future ahead of us. How much of that is also, you know, in the rec space, you know, what she's talking about, that there, there kind of are these opportunities and, and maybe there's an idea, I guess, that um, rec isn't at a certain level, but really there's another advantage there, which is the role that it plays in the community. Right? Uh, you talk about, about something that probably doesn't happen in travel ball, where people are coming from hours away, they're not convening, they're not staying in a field. Whereas you go to your you know, local YMCA, whatever it is, there's people who are gonna be at a field for hours on end. How big a part of what you do, and maybe of your success, do you think that is? And is, and is yeah. that something that really is unique just to the rec level that you can't replicate? I think it may be unique to the rec level. Um, the, we have kids, you know, you, we had just had vac school vacation week, right? We, so we had teams that needed players, you know, so we had games all day on Saturday. And there were kids at the field all day playing. They played with Brazil in the morning, they played with Eritrea, then they played with Italy. There were kids who played four games that day because they just were hanging around the fields. That doesn't happen in travel, unfortunately. Now, we also have a travel component, right? We have some kids, you know, when you get to be 13 years old, you, we have to give them opportunities to, to play at a higher level. So we have those opportunities too, but those kids are also playing rec. They're playing rec and travel. So there's, I'm, not, I, I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with travel. I just think there's so much there when you build kids, uh, when you build a community organizations through rec, it does keep kids around. Um, I'm not sure how, how you can do it without a good rec league. Right, right. So how does the NBA then capitalize on on, on that, on that community that, that is being built in these places? How does that, that benefit the league and, and, and maybe the product? Well, I, I think it, it benefits us in the sense that, you know, if you think about the rec space versus, you know, the travel space in a sense, you know, if your first experience with the game is in a super hyper-professionalized, pressure-filled environment, you might be less likely to continue to play. Um, and so having that rec option, you know, and having that communal aspect provides a positive experience, a, a positive initial experience for that young person that likely, you know, inspires them to continue participating. Where do you see as the next steps? Like where, where else can you influence in this, in this recreational level? Where else could we influence? Um, I think we have to grow our numbers. I think we have to remind our communities and our parents to stay at home, and if we could invest in more fields where a kid is walking down the street, especially when you're looking at underserved communities, transportation is not always available, whether it's you know a single family home or a lack of public transportation. In a place like New York City, it's easy to get on the subway or a bus or walk somewhere, but most of the communities that we're helping, they're traveling 30, 40, 50 miles away. How can you possibly get to play? The other constraint is the lack and number of fields that are out there going beyond needing to renovate and you know, get these fields upgraded. Um, we're installing lights. Extended play is absolutely critical. There was actually a project in the Midwest we invested in. We found out that students were being pulled out of school in the middle of the day to play baseball. I mean, yeah. this was incredible. And yeah. first and foremost, let's keep our kids in school so they get an education, right? Like, use the six inches between both ears, and that's their future. So we believe that baseball and softball transforms lives. So we're teaching them skills on the field to so only teach them skills off the field. So we see high quality coaches at men as mentors and we really think about our kids becoming major league citizens. Like that's our mantra at the end of the day. And if you want to move into developmental and elite play, then great. Then there's opportunities that major league baseball provides such as breakthrough series and everything else that we offer, Hank Aaron Invitational. So there's different laddered approaches that we take on, but we just have to get more investment to keep the game going locally and across the country in every corner of the United States. I saw the light bulb go off when she started talking about facilities. Is that your biggest kind of challenge? We need more lights. You know, we, we, we've discussed that with the city and you know, the, the, the neighbors don't want How lights. How does the city respond? The city's been very supportive. Really? They love it, yeah. Is, they're, is they're that something yeah. that came easy, or, or did it take a lot of work? We have a, we have a paid executive, we're a volunteer organization with a paid executive director, and um, she's been around for 15 years, and she's uh, you know, helped establish really good relationships with the city. Um, 
and the city likes what we're doing, you know, so that's going well. Now, we need more lights. We'd like more turf fields. I don't know if Major League Baseball would fund soccer fields. <laughs> but, you play you know, baseball and yeah. soccer on the same. Um, uh, but, yeah, so those are, those are our challenges we all face. Uh, really, the hockey model is squeeze as many people onto the ice as you, you can run a good practice in, in small spaces. And working with our coaches so they don't think they need a full field to run a good practice is important. The coach training component of this is so important. You don't need, you know, a full soccer field to run a good practice. Um, so the best coaches can do a really good work in small spaces. That being said, we got more, you know, we have 1,800 kids. A few years ago, we had 850 kids. Mm. We need more space and more lights, especially in the fall. The spring's okay, but the fall is, um, it gets dark early in Massachusetts, uh, you know. So yep. we would love more lights. The ESPN. Rain. Yeah, I, I'll put in a word, trust me. <laughs> okay, thank you. It would be the first time they listened to me, but I, I, I would take it. You know, these programs are great, but you obviously have to attract people to them, right? And, uh, it's an incredibly competitive youth sports landscape. You talked about kind of some of the things that you did. Um, I guess let's, we'll start it with the NBA, though. What are the things that you do? What are some of your policies? What are some of your ideas in terms of attracting, whether it's the refs, players, parents, to your rec product? Well, I mean, I, I think one of the, the real benefits is that we are a pretty influential global brand, <laughs> so the name goes a long way. Uh, you know, and, and making sure that you know, people understand that there is a direct connection to the NBA and the WNBA through our programs. Uh, you know, whether that's bringing players out to speak, um, to engage with the kids in the community, um, whether that's really providing an elevated experience, you know, through the gear that's, that's being worn, uh, through obviously officiating, um, you know, coach development, uh, you know, and really building out resources that you know, all of our stakeholders can access. Um, and, and, you know, we partner with a lot of entities in this room to really enhance that experience for those who are participating in our programs. Um, and so, you know, I, again, I think, you know, just being able to leverage the NBA brand, um, the WNBA brand, you know, really goes a long way, especially with young people and, and just the cultural influence that we have. What about a Major League Baseball? Very similar approaches as our friends at the NBA. Um, you know, giveaways, access to former current players. I mean, there's a cachet, right, when you're partnering with Major League Baseball, but also in this case, the Players Association, which owns the Rolodex um, for these superstars. And with the RBI program um, and some of our other forms of elite play, I mean, there are some unique giveaways, unique access to being trained by former coaches, former players, meeting the commissioner, meeting baseball executives. But I think we're also trying to tie the line that, you know, most of these kids aren't going to make it into the professional league, the major leagues. So offering them opportunities for a lens into what does it look like in a job, an internship in the front office, we really want to diversify all of these front offices because we know our talent is really strength in numbers, but strength in the diversity, the ideas, and the skills. So we're looking at a variety of different approaches that are also coming off the field. Um, it's building a lifelong pipeline in many different ways. So Major League Baseball, NBA, they flash the logo, no problem, credibility. What's it like for Cambridge Youth Soccer Session? How, you know, you had to convince parents to do something that was different. Yeah, it's, 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 it's taken time, right? We're not the NBA. We're not uh, Major League Baseball. Um, so it took time. We built a success. We had some success. Then we had a little more success, a little what more success. success. Success, people, kids were really having fun bringing their friends to play and having a competitive experience at the third, fourth grade level. Then those third and fourth graders became fifth and sixth graders, you know, and they continued to play with us. People were not leaving as quickly for other sports. Um, we did coach training, which made our practices better. You know, like volunteer coaches need training. Um, it really helps the experience for, the, for, for volunteer coaches so they know what they're doing out there. Um, and it's more fun for the kids when you have a trained coach. So we had some success, um, and then COVID came and that gave us the green light to say, all right, everyone plays City League hmm. uh, because the city wasn't going to allow us to travel. And then in the fall of 2020, we had reasonable numbers. In the spring of 2021, we just ballooned like crazy um, because people were so excited with this. It wasn't so much that you don't have to travel, right? Some people would say, oh, you don't have to travel. This is good stuff locally. We actually sell, you don't want to travel. You want to play rec when you're young. It's better for the kids. It's better for you as a family. How many families drive two hours to go to watch their kids sit on the bench? 
Um, so we, we tell people it's better. Your kid's going to develop better. The ball's going to be at her feet more when you're playing seven on seven locally than playing 11 on 11 on a club team. Um, now, when they get older, it's a different story, mm -hmm. right? But when they're younger, we really believe. And I, you know, you're a good salesman, you believe what you're selling. I think I really believe what I was selling, and, and the board members I have with me really believe what we were selling. We said, your kids are better off playing with us. And by the way, it's $100 rather than $3,000, and if you need financial aid, we'll give you whatever you need. Um, you're better off with us, and you can walk to practice. Like, what's not to like about this? The kids are better off. I wonder what about the impact on the community? Yeah, it's a fantastic impact on the community, right? You know, you got families, you know, we got the, the janitors at the school and the biotech titans sitting on the sidelines together, high-fiving each other. They don't see each other otherwise very much. Youth sports is where people come together. You really have diversity um, in youth sports. You know, Cambridge celebrates its diversity, but, uh, you know, where we see it most, I think, is on the youth sports sidelines. Yeah, and not just youth sports, but very specifically, I think, rec sports, right? It's, it's the easiest and, and most clear point of access. Guys, great stuff, uh, excellent insight, really enjoyed it. Rec sports, obviously, um, so valuable, not just, as we were mentioning, as a point of access, but also uh, as a place where development comes first, right? Not winning or losing, not necessarily your ranking. And actually, speaking of rankings, our next guest specializes in just that. He's Neil Lodine. He's the founder of the popular website, myhockeyrankings.com. And he has a very important announcement, one that is being lauded uh, by USA Hockey, the sports governing body in this country. Neil? Thanks, Sebastian. Um, good morning. My name is Neil Lodine. I'm the founder of My Hockey Rankings, as Sebastian said. And um, yes, we rank youth hockey teams. Um, we've been doing so for 19 seasons. Um, we even have the opportunity to work with USA Hockey um, to help with their at-large selection bid for the national championships and seeding teams um, for their, like I said, their national championships. Um, it's been an honor. Um, ironically, when I started this 19 seasons ago, I really did not set out to create a ranking system. Um, I was um, stuck in trying to resolve a problem that is pretty common out there, which is um, my son's team was playing a lot of uncompetitive hockey games um, to the point where it was driving people from the sport. And, you know, the, the question was, what could we do to resolve that issue? And, um, you know, so... I would say the bottom line is, you know, uncompetitive games are bad for the sport. Um, they, they do contribute to a lack of development, um, a lack of retention, and really some lagging um, satisfaction rates within the sport. Uh, you know, the good news is our platform, working with USA Hockey and some of their initiatives, I think we've made a significant impact in, in reducing the amount of uncompetitive games in the sport. Um, but the bad news is uh, we have a ranking system and a lot of parents are still focused on those rankings. Um, and, and I'm not here to deny that today. Um, this past December, the New York Times did a full page write up on my company and kind of the business of youth sports rankings. Um, one byproduct of that article was that Tom Ferry reached out um, from the Aspen Institute um, and, and challenged us to, to have a dialogue. Um, we were skeptical. Um, you know, that's kind of what we do. Um, but we accepted his invitation. We had a discussion. Um, it turns out we have a lot in common. And as a result of that conversation, and discussions with USA Hockey, um, you know, we've agreed to make a change that we think will improve the sport of hockey. Um, so with that, um, uh, we are proud to announce um, today that we will stop the practice of ranking 10 U, um, 10 and under youth hockey teams um, on our website. We will continue 
to collect data. Um, we will continue to um, rate teams, but focus on educating our users to understand how the site can be used without putting numbers, ranking numbers, in front of the teams. Um, so again, we're proud to announce that. Um, part of the way that we, we add value in the hockey community, um, unlike some of the other systems that are out there, in our system, a one point difference in a rating system equates to a one goal difference um, in competitiveness amongst the teams. And um, in doing that, um, pretty much every hockey tournament in the country, in North America, uses our data to improve the competitiveness, um, really the atmosphere of their, their, their um, events. And um, what, so, so the, the ratings still have that value. Um, and what we're going to do is take this as an opportunity um, to focus on the youngest parents and coaches, administrators, and teach them how they can use those numbers to, like I said, improve the competitiveness. Um, we will also be investing um, significant resources in doing that educate, not just removing the rankings, but um, educating our user base on how they can use the system more effectively. Um, in a technology-driven world, um, I'm not sure that we're ever going to go backwards from, from the ranking system um, that exists in all sports today. Um, but I would like to challenge um, national, regional, state organizations to consider how they might use ranking systems in the future um, to help with uh, player development, um, uh, competitiveness, and in the end, um, improve the overall fun factor for the kids in the sport. Um, I'd like to thank USA Hockey, Project Play, the Aspen Institute, and uh, Tom Ferry, um, and his staff for the opportunity here today. Thank you.